and welcome to the Officio Spotlight podcast. My name is Simon Lipscomb and thank you very much for listening. I'm really excited about today's podcast because I get to speak to a senior procurement leader actually about their experience of how to consider and then execute a successful procurement transformation program. And as part of this discussion, I think we'll cover all the issues, but also we'll talk, I think, particularly about how you might engage with a third party consultancy and perhaps most importantly, how you get the best from them. So I think some interesting learnings for me personally in this conversation as well. And my guest today is Rachel Dolan. Rachel is the Head of Procurement and Supplier Relationship Management at Permanent TSB. Permanent TSB is one of the oldest banks in Ireland. Rachel's held a number of roles in that business and has over 15 years experience within the financial services industry. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining me for the conversation today. Again, as always, we should probably start at the beginning. I mentioned you'd held a number of roles within the bank. I was interested to understand how you became to be in procurement. Yeah, lovely to be here, Simon, and, and nice to meet you too. So I've been very fortunate to have been with, as you said, Permanent TSB, uh, one of the oldest banks in Ireland for the last seven years. I joined from one of our competitors, Allied Irish Bank, so another Irish retail bank. And right. the role that I took at that time was actually to head up our mortgage litigation department. And, and really the key to that role, and I suppose the reason that I was given the role, it needed a combination of somebody who could manage a vendor and stakeholder management, but also somebody who could take on a fairly immature and new operation and consider that under, I suppose, the headings of you know people, process, technology, the usual, and how we could outsource parts of our business. So it was a combination of things I had done in the past, while litigation was not my area of expertise. I'm not a lawyer. So it was very much in the space that I was operational or had a lot of experience dealing with vendors or third parties and how they could support. So that was job number one. One, I did a year or two of that. And during that time, I kind of mobilized around vendor management or stepping up kind of the bigger managed service pieces. And I was asked by our COO at that time to create a function in our operations unit to manage all third party risk and vendor management. So I was asked to sort of set up, design that, put the framework in place and, and help others manage their key suppliers. So I did that for a while. And then I was asked by our CFO at the time we were doing doing a deleverage, which is the sale of some of our mortgage book. And I was asked to work with our strategic third party, I suppose, enabling that mortgage book. Sounds a little bit like, I suppose, that's the terminology you use in these things. But I was asked to support the third party in a piece of work they were doing for that mortgage book. So I did that. And then as a consequence of that and having a lot of interaction with our CFO at the time, an opportunity came up where our previous head of procurement had left the organisation. Procurement had moved into the finance domain where it hadn't been previously and our CFO asked me would I take a look at procurement and I guess at the time he was probably saying you know leveraging I have a lot of expertise around vendor management around third-party risk around dealing with stakeholders and suppliers and mobilizing new teams and and things like that so I've been in procurement now here in PTSB for three years and that's how I got here. Excellent so I guess in some ways a slightly interesting route into procurement when you first took that role on three years ago I mean what were your immediate thoughts how did you find it where did you start in that sense yeah so I suppose like anything else I'd had a number of blank pages over the seven years so I always tend to grab those with relish so I really think my nature is just understanding the the landscape and the lay of the land so I think with anything right and procurement is no different so there was a few things that were new to me like working in finance was new and also the subject matter around uh, around procurement was pretty new too so I really set about like learning the area quite quickly we had some Gartner licenses so you know obviously Gartner in the space so I was able to really consume a lot of content around procurement sourcing vendor management I attended a number of conferences at the time when we were allowed out and to meet people in person I reached out to contacts and my network in the other retail bank and I suppose spent a lot of time just doing that discovery what's this all about and how do I bring my skills to bear and how do I make the most out of this so that was kind of the start of it I suppose really for me the key at that time was you're not a procurement person Rachel so if you are going to be successful in procurement you probably need to surround yourself with some strong procurement people because the skills that I have to bring are not that so I think that was probably step one on the journey find some other people that know what this is and together I suppose build a view of the future and so we mentioned in the introduction of this podcast that we might focus the conversation a little bit on procurement transformation because I guess one of the outcomes from you coming into this role is you and the 
bank decided to undertake a procurement transformation program. I was really interested to understand again what led to that thinking and, and what were you trying to achieve from that program? What was the desired outcome and the driver for doing it? I think it was simple, really. I mean, the bank had been through a range of quite senior executive changes and procurement as the discipline had probably moved from executive committee member, like one to the other. So right. prior to me getting the role, there had been a move out of a sort of COO domain into the finance domain. So it became very clear then what the CFO wanted was savings and cost optimization. So that yep. then became the lens by which to view procurement or procurement as as a lever rather than it being the part of the business that put contracts in place or the part of the business that can give you the list of our suppliers or the part of the business that you go to if you have a problem with an invoice. All of the fairly standard procurement being just a function that's forgotten about, administrative, nobody really talks to them. They're the fun police, so best best avoid them. Um, Yeah, yeah, so this was kind of a a new piece and really the CFO was heavily, heavily involved making that's so important in any transformation to have that executive sponsorship and buy-in and he knew that procurement could be a real driver of our cost agenda and that was the lens I was asked to look at it through. Understood. I suppose so that was a positive move to this focus on the value of procurement and and, you know the cost reduction opportunities etc. How did you then start to formulate what you needed to do to achieve that cost reduction program like what was the thinking and what steps did you undertake to get to that round? There was probably two tracks I mean one was just dealing with the as-is environment, right? So the people in the team, did we have the right skill set? Did we need to onboard some more people? Did we have the right numbers? So we had a continuous improvement review, which is always a joy in financial services and had had a a whole raft of kind of action points around our policies weren't fit for purpose and our processes weren't fit for purpose and we didn't have the right technology. We didn't have the right system. So in terms of setting the groundwork, we kind of had a roadmap given to us that said, you know, you need to go about doing these things so it was clear I had to address roles role profiles people it was clear I had to address policy and process and controls and it was clear I needed to deal with technology and to purchase something in that respect that would help us particularly in a contracting space the ongoing question was who has the list of suppliers that seemed to be a question that always came to procurement you have the list or you have all the contracts so that was kind of the as is piece that I started on one side in terms of trying to grapple with the cost and with the savings element I really had to work very closely with my finance team around pulling the covers off things that I've never really spent a huge amount of time in you know the budget how we're spending what we're spending what spend controls are there how are the businesses getting you know suppliers onboarded how are they dealing with commercials because really we probably were addressing five percent of our spend if right, that, right. you know, because there was no visibility around it. There was very little of it was controlled by procurement. So I suppose that took me down a different road and probably where we first started to look at getting third party support. Yeah. It felt like that was a little bit bigger than what we could do ourselves. And I think we should say in the interest of transparency that as a Pichet, lucky enough, I think, to be chosen as your partner for that. But this absolutely not the intention of this conversation I think it'd be really interesting for our listeners to understand when you get to that point of wanting some third party support for a project like this what's the best way to go about it what have you learned through this process and how would you advise people who are thinking about engaging a third party support program like this what are the things to consider yeah and in the interest of transparency obviously you guys did end up being our chosen partner but it was through a very long and involved and quite a rigorous process I'm happy to to talk to that so we have a number of consultancy firms that work with us all the time and we had had continuous improvement or process optimization program in the bank for about three years prior to this and as happens with any good consultancy piece of work they leave over the next piece of consultancy work so I suppose a proposition had been made which is obvious if procurement word it's the same for all consultants as an entry you know you have yeah. too many suppliers yeah. supplier consolidation will save you money will save you cost will save you overhead etc so it's sort of procurement transformation 101 so we'd had this consultancy firm say look you've got too many we think we can go at it but we think we can go at it by doing this and I was very fortunate that that proposition was fed back to me through the CFO to say you know do you believe what's been said here 
do you believe that this is possible? And I guess because I had spent six or eight months learning it myself and really getting into the weeds of how things were working in our organization, I was able to say that looks fine on paper, but that's going to be very challenging to deliver based on what I know about how we're set up, right? That yeah. like A plus B doesn't equal C in this regard. Yeah. But it it certainly gave me the platform to say, while I don't believe that story, I definitely think this is something we can do. Like we definitely can achieve because they were saying, you know, we can achieve 10 million in cost savings by doing these things. Yeah. And the CFO was kind of challenging me to say, this is your area. Like you you should be saving this. Like this is what you should be doing. How are how are you going to do it? And I said, well, I can do it, but I would also need help. Like I, I can't do it by myself I don't like this plan but I'm willing to go and, and find a better plan right. I mean this consultancy firm stayed with us on on the RFP journey and, and the physio competed against them but what we did was we actually provided a lot of real detail so we gave all of our spend data we said yeah. here's all our spend data like uh, the actual data we gave all of our budget data so we gave all our forecasting, we gave all our MTP, we, we gave all that. Yeah. And then we set an investment business case challenge and said, we've given you the reality and we're going to set you nearly like a goal seek. We're, we're setting you this target. Yeah. You tell us how you get those numbers to equal this cost saving over what period and exactly how you're going to do it. Right. And we want to know how much it's going to cost us in professional fees, how much it's going to cost us in internal resourcing and how much you think we need to spend on technology to make it happen so like yeah, we yeah. really threw the kitchen sink into the rfp which made for some like really really interesting and robust reading and it took us probably from november i would say november 2019 to march our covid the faithful covid march where we had supplier on site so that's how long the rfp process took Took, yeah. and before we finally identified and selected a preferred partner in Officio. Understood. So you, there was a very rigorous process that you described and then you, you've selected your partner. Again, I'd be really interested to understand, you know, what were the challenges from that point? Because I guess that's where the hard work starts, right? <laughs> it's all well and good to, in, in theory. And I guess particularly interested in the context of that challenge aligning almost exactly with COVID, right? I mean, that, yeah. that, those two things are very, very interesting. And again, for our listeners, it'd be great to kind of share a little bit about that experience if you could. Well, what was really interesting in it, choosing a partner was invariably everybody came back with the same things that they would go after, right? So, yes. so they were all the same spend categories. It was all the same. Like So in and around, we'd, I think we had nine or 10 originally in the mix. And then our second round was maybe still four or five. So when it came down to select a partner, what really won it for us, I think there was a cultural fit piece around our organization. So we're two and a half thousand people in the context of the UK economy, like very, very small and, and a small, almost a regional bank, even though we're soon to be the third largest in Ireland. So it's small, a flat structure, you know, a singular head office right yeah, so it's yeah. a head office function so and we've had huge experience as all financial services firms do of dealing with the big four the top tier consultants understanding how they work what they deliver what it looks like fairly cookie cutter and officio for us presented something different and it sort of spoke to us in a time where we really wanted something different so it won out on the basis of singularly focused as a procurement only consultancy right yeah. uh, everybody else it was a, a part of their skill set as opposed to the only thing they did the idea that the officio team would actually be able to deliver like on the ground support like roll up their sleeves be part of the team work with us as opposed to be consultants just you know presenting more and more powerpoint and more and more things that we would then have to deliver officio felt like an organization that that we would want to work with so that was selection and then i guess as we moved into picking like none of us knew or realized i mean I mean, the on-sites in March was the first time any of us had used even Zoom, right? You know, and yeah. I was put, yeah. putting together meetings, you know, copying and pasting Zoom links and texting them to myself and sending them back to, like, when you think of it now, like, it was so hodgepodge. But we got through it. But then we stepped onto an engagement where, I suppose, we didn't realise, but we were really never going to meet any of these <laughs> consultants, like, physically or in person. And I think that straight away became, a, like, a really big factor in this engagement and something that we had to really really manage because 
I say to the guys that we work with a lot, like Irish people are people, people, right? So we like yeah. to be with people. There's a lot about shaking hands or looking people in the eye or reading people's body language or th- their expressions. And that's all gone. It's just all completely gone. So having to do everything by Zoom, like you can't knock on the door of the CFO and ask him, you know, how are things today and how's it going? And are you happy with us? And, you know, yeah. embed yourself in the psyche you're not there so it meant a lot of debriefs a lot of wash-ups after meetings where you were kind of trying to explain yes I know that stakeholder said I agree with you but they didn't really because I can tell because oh, I know them and how yeah so we did a lot of that and it just meant that the stakeholder management people's communication skills understanding the context of an organization understanding the politics of an organization all of a sudden became a really big thing right yeah. in covid but on the flip side of that in terms of value delivery no travel no missed time no yeah. meetings for meeting sake no struggling to find rooms we always seem to be together okay virtually but we were always together it was never an issue so i suppose there was ups and downs to it and it's only been in the last, so the programme is, what, 18 months and on the go now. It was only three weeks ago or two weeks ago now. I'm not even sure when, when the contingent of officio team first came over to Ireland and to Dublin yeah. and to, to meet our team. So, and even with that, it, it probably became a week where we did the least amount of work we've done <laughs> because we lost so much time sort of commuting to meet each other and and to be together so it's been a real factor of the engagement but something that in non-covid times you don't even think about no. these things great to just that of interest was there, was there ever a period with, with yourself and the finance director at the start of covid where you questioned doing this or was that never on, on the table Yes. So the RFP originally at the time asked for three things, cost optimization, the development of an enduring model, really, like particularly focusing on strategic relationship management, but also the development of a technology roadmap and the support to replace our procure to pay system, right? Our our end to end source to contract technology. And just as we decided to progress, we removed the technology aspect from our requirement because we knew very early on in COVID that there is no way our technology stack or the capacity within our organization would have been there to do a technology transformation of the size, like replacing your ERP system in the in the best of times with nothing going on is a massive endeavor. So I think we called it fairly early to say we can't do that part. And then really just the cost optimization piece just became the, the pillar that we focused on. And ultimately we've been super successful, which is great. Yeah, being 18 months into this. Are there anything you would do differently? Any, again, any advice you would give to our listeners on things to think about, things you tripped over that maybe other people should be aware of, and you know, learnings on how you best use a consultancy like us or someone else to, to the best effect? Yeah. It's hard to give learnings when the circumstances we've been in have been so unusual because you tell yeah. us that the 18 months we've had won't manifest themselves again as it has been for us. But if I strip that aside, I think for me, the main learning has been slow and steady kind of wins the race. Okay. And I know that probably sounds a little bit ridiculous because we had a three year plan or the objective was 10 million in enduring OPEX savings over three years. That was the plan. That was the objective. Yeah. So we've actually saved in the first 18 months over 13 million of our original scope and probably an additional 3 million of scope that wasn't baselined at the start, but that we brought in. So we've bust our target and we've done it in a shorter time, which I think probably deserves party cannons all around. But for me, probably still feels like it's been a long time. And I don't know if that's because the COVID 18 months has just been a long time for everybody. It just feels like we've been doing this for a long time. I suppose that would be the one. And the other thing is you get the most out of a piece like this when you are embedded in it and yeah. working it every single day so I don't know I think Simon our physio consultant feeds back to me a lot that my own style is a little unusual about how engaged I've been with this program but I've been with these consultants every single day like yeah. every single day for 18 months 
at least for a half an hour in the mornings and often, you know, multiple other meetings during the day. So it has become my singular focus. Yeah. When you work it and you work something every single day, you achieve great things, which we have done. But we've done it through hard work and toil. And, and all during that, we've had loads of things happen under the cover. We've had massive attrition in our own team. We've had yeah. we've probably rolled the team over three or four times for loads of different reasons. Yeah. And we've had to yeah. keep that show on the road. We have had massive digital transformation program. We've been dealing with strategic vendors far and above what our organization would have ever dealt with before my tenure. So, so much has changed in the last 18 months, but the real reflection is this isn't something that you can just buy in consultancy, allow them to do it to yeah. you by yourself and magic will happen. Yeah. And it's very much a team effort. And so much so we were shortlisted recently in the National Procurement Awards for Best External Collaboration with Officio. And it has been completely a collaborative effort, but the consultants don't just take the work and sprinkle the magic back on the organization I think you know it's hard work one of my last questions Rachel so you've I guess you've you've come into procurement as opposed to having worked in it all your life you've had a three-year stint which has included a a big slice of COVID and a huge procurement transformation program I'm just interested in your views on the future of procurement for you for the bank generally as as an industry what are your thoughts funny like I love it like I, I really do and I think I love it because I think for people who are you know like to be with other people right yeah. the stakeholder management piece is so key communication is so key like negotiating is about communicating right so if you're a good communicator and you like to be with people and, and you like managing people and being around people I'm quite organized I like projects I like plans I like a lot of change you know and, and procurement is that procurement people are very commercially adept project managers right who get to deal with masses and masses of variety because it changes every day the stakeholder what you're buying what you're doing so really of all the different jobs I've had like it brings together Together, so much excitement kind of in the one place there really is so much to do and to be such a valuable part of an organization driving cost optimization is huge and you know when I go to our executive team and they're just so happy you know and the numbers speak for themselves and everyone is sort of shaking your hand and celebrating it's great it's a really great place to be I definitely think procurement possibly needs some sort of rebranding I definitely think even in our organization like when you say procurement I'm sure there's people out there with the roly eye emoji it's something it's all about the rules it's all about the checklist it's all about the process it's all about the competition and it's not really I think procurement are business enablers you know they they really are and when you get really great deals for the business and they're happy yeah there's, there's no better place to be so that's kind of my overall thoughts on procurement what I think for me it's just shown me really that there's so much flexibility around what people can do with their careers I think I definitely felt at the start I started looking around going does anybody know like I I've never done this before that whole fake it till you make it but I thought this is but it really not that it doesn't matter of course it matters I mean it's not for everybody you can only use and excel using your skills and the really important thing for me how lucky have I been I've had a fantastic team of my own within PTSB and then to be able to align with and join with the procurement specialist organization who's there like helping us learn helping us grow being a part of our journey I've been super lucky I think procurement will continue to play a really strong role in the future in PTSB as I think it does across industry in much bigger and different organizations to ours but it's definitely a key driver and it's not just about cost it's not just about value realization but it's around managing strategic partnerships and yeah. helping your organization innovate around the, your suppliers I mean there's the work that we're doing now has moved beyond cost we're we're definitely focusing a lot on risk a lot on the bank sort of risk exposure risk profiles around our suppliers particularly interesting around ESG and sustainable procurement and, and how that has such a massive impact on strategic supplier relationships and yeah. around we're spending huge money with big organizations and how to partner and manage those so there's so many avenues and so many ways to go with procurement like I certainly would encourage people to look at it as a place to be for sure it's a great place to work Fabulous. Rachel that feels like an appropriate place to draw the conversations with conclusions and I just want to say thank you again for your time sharing your thoughts and your experiences on this podcast it's really appreciated hopefully not speaking on your behalf but I guess if listeners have questions you'd be happy for them to send them across Um, yeah of course anytime love making new contacts and meeting new procurement people Simon yeah it's been a real pleasure and thanks for having me fabulous thanks so much
If you enjoyed this podcast, please click the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also absolutely love to hear your views. So please do leave us a review on those platforms or indeed send me a message on LinkedIn. And we'll be back soon for another discussion with senior industry figures. Bye.